You know, uh, somebody who is here before the first gathering and who's in the room right now and who usually comes for both but sort of comes in and attends the second gathering said to me this morning that uh, they're like, you know what, I usually attend the second gathering because those people are a lot more sort of awake and engaged. So, you know, like, I don't know if that sort of raises the bar higher than you feel comfortable or if that sort of inspires you, but I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, hey, do you know um, that, uh, that we are officially past Thanksgiving now, right? So all those sort of rules about what is and isn't appropriate in terms of decorating and what you're able to listen to, like, the, there's been a shift, right? And, uh, and so, and actually, it's not just that we're past Thanksgiving, but we are actually in the month of December. Now, this morning, out in the prayer circle at 825, uh, you know, when, when we kind of circle up and, and ask God just to sort of come and, and, and bless our day, uh, it was great. I was, I was making that comment that, hey, do you know that it's the start of December? And as I was, as these words were getting ready to come out of my mouth, in my periphery, I saw Kevin Baldner wearing his chaps, thankfully with jeans, um, <laughs> And then where I was standing straight out the door, I could see his motorcycle, right? He drove his motorcycle here today, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, it's hard to think that it's actually in December now when people are still riding their motorcycles to church. Some of maybe us who are also motorcycle riders are like, I wish it was a little bit warmer and I could ride my bike too. Uh, but uh, but I, no, I thought that was awesome. And so we are entering the Christmas season Today we are starting our Christmas series, and it's true, right? Some of you love this time of year. Others of you, this time of year is a struggle for any number of reasons. I, I know my sister and I, we were even uh, messaging back and forth last night. This is not only the first year without mom, but this is the first year with real, without any living parents on planet Earth. And, uh, and that makes things different, doesn't it? And, uh, and, and we're going to be all right. We're going to get through that. But, but for some of us, this is a, a time of year where we struggle. And for others of us, when we hit December, we really just kind of enter survival mode and we want to make it to January, right? If I, can, if I can hit 2019 and I'm alive and I haven't, like, killed someone or committed some crime or wound up in jail, like, it's a win, Right? And so I actually want to want to help you, right? I want to help equip you for this month. Is that cool? Now, th this is not, I noticed in the first gathering, it really wasn't readable. But I found this the other day. I want to share this with you. It was, it was three Christmas rules. Uh, and again, you probably can't read it. We'll stick it up there. But, uh, but I'll read it to you. The, the, the first one, this is so good. It says this, don't go into debt trying to show people how much you love them. That is such great advice, right? We feel all kinds of pressures and things. Don't do that. Number two, uh, don't go visit family if it compromises your mental health, right? This is so good. Like for how many of us, you know, especially if you have more Cousin Eddie's in your family than your fair share, right? Like you just need permission to like prioritize your health and well-being instead of having to spend hours and days with people who, who sort of, you know, compromise you. And then here's the third one. It, it, this is a little bit different. If someone comments on your weight, eat them. <laughs> the first two I'd highly recommend. The third one, prayerfully consider and however God leads, you know, kind of follow his lead in that. Now, I want to get a little bit more serious here. Uh, at this time of year, I often like to make a joke about, uh, you know, there's sort of those of us who really love Christmas music and those of us who really don't love Christmas music at all. And so for you, if you are one of those who loves this time of year and you love Christmas music, you're all set, right? Because you'll see things on Facebook and you'll, you'll play Christmas music on your, your, your radio and all that kind of stuff, maybe even at home in, in various ways. But for those of you who you really don't like Christmas music, and, and you know you're not only going to be inundated everywhere else, but you're going to come to church, and you're going you're gonna to hear a number of songs that fall into that Christmas music genre, 
like, you know, I, that's not good for you. So I want to give you this helpful thought. I love this. Here's a quote. Some random churchgoer said, I, I really didn't like worship today, right? Like, can you believe first Sunday of December, we already did three Christmas songs, and the response, I think this is actually attributable to Francis Chan, is that's okay, we weren't worshiping you. Isn't that good? Here's the thing, this is not about me. And this is not about you. Even a little bit, right? It's not about us at all. In fact, it is all about him. That's why we do everything we do. It's all about Jesus. And so here's the thing. If we just got that a little bit this Christmas, it would be a huge accomplishment. This idea that this month, this series, our lives, our families, this world, the entire existence of everything is all about Jesus. And my prayer for us as we've been heading toward this month in this series is that we would all take a step in that direction. I don't know about you, it's true for me, right? It's 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 easy sort of in moments of clarity to go, oh yeah, it's all about Jesus. But but how many times in our daily lives do we make it all about us? And and so my prayer is that we would You know, we're not going to get it perfect. None of us does that. But that we would take a step in this direction and that every one of us would make a Christmas connection. Don't you love that image? Right? And I love that present sitting on the hay in a manger. Because the gift that came through a virgin and spent his first night on planet Earth in a manger... He changed everything. And he continues to change everything, right? Jesus changes absolutely everything. And this gift is not just a get out of hell free card. If we have truly received this gift of Jesus, then our lives should be a greater gift too, right? If, you're, if, you, have, if you claim to have received this gift and your life isn't a greater gift there, is a problem. So these next five weekends, we're going to talk about this gift. We're going to talk about what it means. And we are all going to be invited to be a part of making a Christmas connection together that will impact our lives and will impact others as well. Does that sound good? Like if we could do some simple things together over just these next number of weeks that would impact us, help us make a Christmas connection and also help and bless and transform others' lives? Is that something we'd want to be a part of? I think so. And so today, I just want to give you a couple things. I want to give you the why behind this Christmas series. Why are we doing this Christmas series? Why are we going to try to accomplish the things we're going to try to accomplish this month? I want to give you the why today. And then I want to give you the what. Um, Pretty simple kind of thing. Why and what. So let's pray And uh, we'll jump in. God, today, I thank you for the gift of sharing this time and sharing this space together. And Father, today, we confess, for some of us, this is just our favorite time of year. And we love the energy and the lights and the presence and the music and everything about it. God, for others of us, we really struggle at this time of year. And Lord, for others of us, we just enter survival mode hoping to make it through the holidays. But God, no matter where we are, I pray for every one of us in this room that you would help us to to make a Christmas connection that would bless and transform us and be a gift to others as well. We ask these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a couple of verses, series verses, that I want us to think about each week uh, this month. And the first one is found in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. Now John 1, John, I love how he does this. He a lot of times uses sort of cosmic or spiritual language to describe things that the other gospel writers use very pragmatic things. And so John 1 starts 
with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? This idea that the Word, that Jesus uh, didn't just come to earth um, as when, when he was born, right, on, on that Christmas, as five pound, however many ounce baby Jesus, like Ricky Bobby tells us, right? Uh, that wasn't when Jesus came into existence, that Jesus has always existed, and that he, in fact, is God, right? And, and so we have this beautiful language, this cosmic language, telling us the Christmas story in John 1. And my favorite verse is John 1, 14, where the text says, the word became flesh and blood, and you probably know it as, and made his dwelling among us, but I love this translation, right? The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. This is the foundational thought for this entire series, that God himself put on flesh, came to this earth, showed us how to live, lived a perfect life, and then gave his life for all as a sacrifice so that we could be forgiven of sin and receive eternal life. Uh, another way to say this would be this. At Christmas, we celebrate the greatest gift ever given. We have the gift of forgiveness of our sin. We have the gift of salvation. We have the gift of God, Emmanuel, which means God with us. And if that were not plenty all by itself, I want to read just a few verses to you that kind of strengthen this case that this is the greatest gift ever given, right? Um, and this, this is found in the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. Um, and again, I think it just sort of strengthens this idea of how significant this gift was. Listen to these words from Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8. The text says this, Though he, speaking of Jesus, was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to or to be grasped. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Wow. Can you imagine this? That God, right? Because we know Jesus is God. So, so he was and is in every way fully God and equal to God, and yet he chose not to cling to, hold to, to grasp, the equality that was rightfully his. He gave that up, became obedient to, to his heavenly father, was willing to come as a slave and give his life like a criminal would. And I love, I love this line. Think of this. He gave up his divine privileges. That's what he had. That's what he deserved. And he gave it up. So, he was everything, he had everything, and he gave everything up to come here for you and for me. This is what we celebrate at Christmas. <laughs> is, I mean, other than the four people, is that not pretty cool? Right? Like, this is unbelievable. So think, think for a second of your greatest sacrifice in life. Does it even scratch the surface of what God was willing to give up for us? I mean, you know, we may think of, well, you know, I used to drive a way nicer vehicle and just the circumstances of my life, and I, I, I drive a lesser vehicle. It's really beneath me, right? Or maybe I, I, at one point I lived in a really nice home, and again, the circumstances of life, and now I don't, I don't, I really don't love where I live. You know, like, whatever, whatever sacrifice you feel like you have, have had to give in life. Now think of this. A gift has been given. We've said it's the best gift that's ever been given, and this gift must be received. We have got to receive this gift. It's not just enough to come, and it's Christmas, so we sing about it, and we celebrate it. This is something for us to unwrap and make part of our lives. There is every reason to do this and no reason to miss out 
on receiving the greatest gift ever given. But there's another part here that bridges the why we're doing what we're doing this month to the what we're actually going to do. And our second series verse is found in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. And I love this little verse. Check it out. It says this, Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you give back. Now, the context here is about not judging, right? And instead of judging, which everyone's in some way, shape, or form probably a little bit more prone to do, we should give and forgive. Now, I was thinking about this week, what are some of the most common reasons people give that they really don't come to church or don't want to come to church? There's a couple, right? The first one is, well, those church people are just hypocrites anyway, right? Have you ever heard that one? And, uh, you know, let's just be honest. Are, are they really, like, all that far off, right? I mean, n- not that we don't work hard and, and try to do our best, but and this is true about me. That's why I have my hand up. Is anyone else kind of like me where, where, where you want to, you wanna, you know, live what you say and you want to, you know, do your best at all this, but, but sometimes you fall short? Anyone else? You know, you know what that's called, right? When you sort of say one thing and proclaim one thing and live a different thing? It's called being a hypocrite, right? So it's like, but, but isn't it good news that God gave a, the gift of himself so that we could sort of be forgiven and set free from the fact that we're not perfect? Right? This is good news. And so, uh, so we have that part, uh, right? Hypocrites. And the other thing that people give for not wanting to come to church all the time it's just, and, and they may not say it this way, but a fear of being judged. It's like, ah, you know, I, my life has been very imperfect. So if I go to church, what are those people going to say? What are they going to think? I mean, a lot of people know this about me or, or that about me. And nobody wants to go somewhere where, where people whisper about them or, or talk about them behind their back, right? Um, and so, but here, this is such a good thing. Isn't it great news for us to be able to give people as they come this Christmas, that, that guess what? Um, God does not want us to, nor does he judge you, uh, but we forgive and give, right? We're generous people with, with even our grace and our forgiveness. The image in this passage, this verse that I read, is from business practices, right? This idea of being pressed down, shaken together to make more room. The idea was that, that you or I may go and we, we may need to buy some grain, right? And so we would purchase a specific amount of grain and they would take the container to measure that amount of grain, right? And so they'd fill up the container and when it got to the top, that's, that's what we wanted to buy, right? Now, here's the thing. If you run a business, you, you want to get the most you can for the least of what you give, right? That's how you sort of make money and, and, and whatever. But the picture here is very different. The picture here is we filled it up, but then we're going to press it down and we're going to shake it in order to be able to put more in, right? We're going to give you as much as we possibly can. And, and then when we hit the, that amount, when we hit the limit, we keep pouring. And so it overflows off the container onto our laps. This is the picture that God has given us. It's sort of like, because some of you are like, that doesn't make much sense to me because I really don't ever go buy grain, right? Um, So let me give you another example. This is like buying french fries at Five Guys. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here, right? Uh, So you go to Five, I actually, the first time I went to Five Guys, I made this mistake where I got like a burger and a large fry, And what I'm about to say, some of you may not know this, is an extremely significant statement. I could not finish the fries. I never have a problem finishing anything, right? I couldn't finish the fries. Because what they do is they give you your container of fries, and then they measure out this, like, huge amount that they scoop into this container, and they just dump it into your bag. Um, 
my family, when we go to Five Guys, here's what we do. We actually each get whatever a burger or a hot dog. Their hot dogs are killer. I recommend the bacon cheese dog. Um, and, uh, and, and we get one large fry for the four of us to share, and it is plenty. Now, I'm talking about this. Some of you might be like, I've never been to Five Guys. I've got to go to Five Guys, and the closest one's on the north end of Worcester, right? So, so, but here's the thing. If you go to Five Guys this week and you walk in, there's a high likelihood that you will, under your breath or in your mind, start cursing my name because it's extremely expensive, right? It's just, you pay a lot for what you get, um, uh, but you get a ton. You, you can get a little fry, and you'll be just fine. And I recommend the Cajun fries, because that's, it's just better that way. Um, so here's, here's, here's what we get from this. If you give forgiveness, you will actually get more forgiveness than you gave, right? If you're just the kind of person who's gracious and forgiving, you will receive grace and forgiveness. If you give judgment, you will get more judgment than you gave. If you're like, you talking about people and, and you judge, you, that, that will visit back on you. If you live this way, like, being generous, right, with your money and your business, with your life, you will always get more than you gave, and you will get more of what you gave, whether that's forgiveness or finances or anything. And this was never more clear to me than um, about eight years ago at our 10th anniversary, our 10th birthday as a church. And uh, I remember because we were coming out of a summer, and one of the things that's usually true about church in the summertime is that, you know, like the giving's usually been tight, a little bit down, so you kind of survive summer. And, and we talked for three months leading up to our, our 10th birthday as a church that we wanted to take a special offering, and we wanted to give that money away to church planting, right? We, we said that um, we would not exist in the same way if other people and churches hadn't given so that we could start, right? And so we wanted to do that same thing so to help other churches start. And so we, we talked about it for three months. And, and I want you to know, leading up to that, I got all sorts of pushback. And it was, d d don't you think, I mean, maybe we could give a portion or a percentage to that, but, you know, things have been really tight around here. Don't you think we should, like, keep like a percentage or a portion and maybe just give like less away. Like I got a lot of people saying those kinds of things. And I just really felt like God wanted us to be generous, right? Like for this significant moment in our history. So we took this special offering. We had about $21,000 come in in that offering. In that same weekend for our 10th anniversary, our, our, our general giving was as far as I can tell, the highest general giving ever for a weekend in the history of our church. We had 21000 in the special offering, and we had 18000 come in that weekend just in the regular offering. And, and it really kicked off a season of our church where we as the people of God were just more consistently generous than I've ever seen us be. It, it was good. So this idea that generosity begets generosity. It, it, it's kind of like this. This is true. You've heard this. Your mom said it this way, right? That, and, and I'm not just going to say what our moms told us, right? That it's better to give than receive. It is actually much better to give than to receive. And some of you are a little bit nervous. You're like, here we go. Rob's going to kick off our Christmas series and mention money, right? No, I'm really not. I want to talk about life, but money is an important part of life, right? In our culture, we make it probably even more important or too important. But there's really good news. Every one of us is different. And so what God asks of us, how he, he wants us to participate, may be different. And so I, I want you to hear these words from 2 Corinthians 9-7 simple, simple verse. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Like, you feel guilt or pressure. Don't, do not, never, ever, ever give for that reason. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So decide, talk to God, make a decision. Don't feel pressure. 
right? Like, because guilt's a bad reason. And then be cheerful. Be cheerful in, in what you do, in your gift. So here we go. Here's the why of this series. It's really all about the greatest gift ever given, right? We were given a gift, right? And, and we've received this gift, and so now we need to become a gift. Uh, we need to do something because of that. Because here's the truth. Isn't it true that some gifts are so great, we just have to live in response to them? Let me just say it again. Well, let's put the slide up. Some gifts are so great, we have to live in response to them, right? We can't help but not do that. Like, if somebody gave you a sweet car, would that not be a game changer? Like, I always think that this time of year, because, you know, if you watch any sort of TV or whatever, and you see all those commercials, like the Lexus December to Remember thing, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, seriously, who, who gets someone giving them a brand new Lexus on Christmas morning? Now, as I, I said in the first gathering, I said, like, my only fear is if Bethany gave that to me, the next thing she would give me would be the little book of the payment thing, and that's not really, like, a gift, right? Uh, um, or what about this? What if you received an organ that you needed to live because you had an organ that failed? Does that not change things? Or what if God gave himself? What if God gave his life for you? Because this is what we are celebrating. And when we receive a gift that big, we can't just say thank you and continue living life as usual. The greatest gift we can give is the same gift that God gave, right? We can put on flesh and we can incarnate. Emmanuel, God with us. The greatest gift we can give is ourselves when we show up consistently and give ourselves and our life and our talents and our energy to help make a difference. Because of the greatest gift that was given and the gift we have received, I want to invite you to consider some specific responses this Christmas. And if we respond, if we do these things, it will uh, only take moments of our life up to maybe an hour an hour a month, an hour a week, and it will change life. So here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to make a list, right? Making a list. Have you heard that from the song? Making a list, right? Today is just that. We're going to make a list. I want to share three things I believe God is asking us to attempt in response to his gift this Christmas. Today we're just making the list. I just want to give you the details. I am not asking you to do anything today. You don't have to do any of these things, even this week. I want you to consider this. I want you to pray about it. I want you to ask God, and whatever God tells you, do that, right? This is just, just the plan. And so these three simple things will impact you, right? They'll help you to make a uh, Christmas connection, and they will make a difference in other people's lives as well. So three, three things. One, uh, I want you to consider participating in a Christmas offering, in a Christmas offering. We actually have our avalanche buckets up here, and, uh, and they're, they're not open today. You cannot give in this offering today. I just want to show you that every other week of the month, these buckets are going to be on stage, and if you want to participate in this Christmas offering, you can feel free to, to do so in, in here. You can continue to use the tall red boxes for your regular giving. If you want to participate in this special offering, those will be out. Th th those aren't open today. I'm not asking you to give anything today. I'm asking you to think about this and pray about this. If, if someone walked up and said, hey, I have a check for a million bucks I want to stick in there, I, well, I'd probably let you give it. Uh, but <laughs> and so what's this offering going to do? Let me tell you. We're actually going to give a third of it. We're going to use a third of it to, as a church, end this year strong, and start next year as well as we can. A third, okay? We've, in the past, we have done uh, a Christmas, a year-end offering where we encourage people to give, and, and it was just to end the year strong. We're only going to use a third of it for that purpose. Um, but you know what? Uh, we've been doing great in our building together as we updated a couple weeks ago, our capital campaign. 
but in our general giving, we've been tracking about $100,000 behind budget this year. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, it'd be good to, to have a little infusion to be able to end strong and begin strong. Amen? Amen. We're going to also use a third of it to fund benevolence. And I'm really excited about this. You guys, you wouldn't know this, but we get requests from people in our church and in our community almost weekly. And uh, the requests we feel like we're, we're able to help with or, or that God's leading us to help with, a lot of times we have to, especially considering, you know, being $100,000 behind budget. So benevolence is usually one of the line items that gets cut when that's the case. Um, we have to stand on our heads sometimes in order to help people. And so like the idea, and whether it's hundreds or thousands or 10,000 bucks, I have no idea what that offering will be. But I just love this idea that we can take a third of it and say, we are only going to use this to bless people in need in our community. That's it. And, and maybe we give a portion of that uh, to Community Help Mission, who we partner with and work together with um, to help meet needs in our community. And then we want to use the final third to actually bless and, and work with ministers and ministries outside of our region. So we want to give a third of it away. Uh, maybe we'll use some for Ukraine kinds of things. Kevin McGee, who was here this summer, who resigned from his church in order to raise his own support to help local churches figure out their missions focus. Uh, maybe we can partner with him in some ways, but, but we're going to do that. So as you leave today, we're actually going to give you a card that looks just like this. The front of it here, we'll put it up on the screen. I love this. Um, it says, uh, bless our church, bless our community, bless our world. Let's make a life-changing Christmas connection. So, so I want you guys to prayerfully consider if God is leading you to do that. And, and so the card is just a reminder for you to take with you. It'll be handed to you at the doors today as you leave. Um, but just put it somewhere and think about it. And if God leads you, great. And if not, that's fine too. Uh, so this may not be for everyone. You don't feel pressure, right? But if it is for you, remember that scripture. Each of us must decide in our heart how much to give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So do whatever God asks you, knowing that your faithfulness will be returned to you in greater measure than you could ever give. And if this is not your time and you shouldn't participate, that's fine. Don't do that. It's fine. Um, and isn't it cool? Here's the thing. I want you to take one more thing there before I tell you number two. If, if you give, I mean, how long does it take to write a check? Seconds? Like less than a minute, right? So, so we could do this. Hopefully you think and pray about it for more than just seconds. But doing this may only take seconds of your life and yet help you to make a Christmas connection that blesses you and blesses our church, our community, and our world. Here's number two. I want you to think about uh, committing to serve in 2019. The first, the first one, the giving one, th this step is kind of a some of us step maybe. This step, this committing to serve, is a more of us or maybe even most of us Step. And we're going to talk a lot about it next week and the final week of this series on December 30th. But here's the cool thing. If you notice the presence up here on the stage on both sides, uh, there's a present that represents most of the ministry areas here at New Hope Community Church. The big presents sort of represent the, the umbrella areas over all of our different ministry areas. So we're going to talk about ways every one of us can serve. And one of the things we've been doing is, is as we've been sort of tweaking and shifting some, some staff structure, is we've created what we call a lead team where there are people who are over areas. Because one of the things I think maybe has happened is some of you in the past have said, hey, I want to serve. And the amount of time it's taken for you to get a response or maybe sort of in, in the, the process, some of us have fallen through the cracks. And, and maybe you felt a little bit like, well, they must not really need my help then which is not true at all. Um, and so what we, we have done is we have created uh, four people that will be, you can go directly to them and they will be your connectors. And so you're going to hear about that. And the thing I'm excited about is this. I think that, that we are 
poised to invest in our volunteers as never before. And, uh, and so I'm excited about this. And serving is one way we get to put flesh on. We get to incarnate. This could take, you know, an hour a week, maybe an hour a month, depending on how you serve, and yet make a huge difference. Because when you and I g- give the gift of ourselves because of him, it makes a huge difference. If you already serve, great. Like, you're good. We're not asking you to serve more or differently. Maybe some of you have served in the same way forever, and you want to try something new. That, you may get clarity on that in the coming weeks as well, and that's great as well. So the first step was a some of us step, right? That last one, serving, was a more of us or a most of us step. This last one is an all of us step. And this all of us step is a step that literally would only take us moments, right? Like minutes this month. And I promise you, if we do this, it will bless us, it will bless you, and it will, it will bless others. It will actually change lives, and it will change families. It will set people free. But it's tough, right? Because most of you, you're like, well, if it just takes a few months, I'm in, right? But here's why it's so tough, because like I said earlier, for some of us, we're a little bit in survival mode, because this is a difficult month. For some of us, we're just trying to make it to, to 2019 alive without winding up in prison, right? Because we did something we shouldn't have done. And, uh, and, and so here's the thing. When that's true, it's so easy just to want to focus on myself, on ourselves, and forget about being on mission, being intentional. So here's the last one. I want to invite you to help share Jesus with a thousand people this Christmas. Over our Christmas weekend, at all our gatherings, we want to share the message of Jesus with a thousand people. Now that sounds like a big number, but let me tell you, last year, December wasn't a particularly uh, great attendance month. Um, We didn't do some of the extra marketing things we typically do. We didn't put our ad in the newspaper like we typically do because the prices had gone way up. Uh, We used just a Facebook ad. And we had 800 people show up here over Christmas weekend, right? And that was without us, like, pushing everybody, hey, you know, do something, invite someone. What if every one of us invited one person or family and strategically brought them to one of our Christmas gatherings? (laughs) Just the front row is going to do this. This is very discouraging. Uh, We have plenty of opportunities. Let me show you. Some of you saw these banners outside. Look at this picture. So we have our Christmas connection. The banners are out front. And it says this, that we have a gathering, four identical ones. uh, One on Saturday, December 22nd at 5 o'clock. So a Saturday evening one. Our regular Sunday mornings at 9 and 11. Uh, We have a Monday afternoon, again, identical to the first three at 3 o'clock. And then at 11 o'clock on Christmas Eve, we have our special candlelight gathering. You have invites on or around your chairs. You're welcome to take, but we have something unique. We actually have tickets, and we have tickets for for every one of those four identical gatherings. We actually have 200, Uh, so, and they're free tickets. There's no cost associated with them, Um, but we want you to to strategically pick when you're going to come and when you're going to invite and you can go to stop by the hub and get your tickets for whichever gathering time you want. Uh, invite others. Get If you're like, hey, it's a Wednesday and I've decided, you can actually go on the website, newhope.rocks, and click and reserve your things there. You don't have to get a paper ticket. So can anyone you want to invite. Um, and now I know for some of you, you're hearing this and you're like, Rob, this is ridiculous. Because here's what I usually do, because my, my December's busy, and so I wait till the very last second, and then whichever Christmas gathering is convenient for me, I just show up at that one. Are you telling me I can't just do that? Yes. Because if you haven't claimed your spot, and that gathering sells out, and because we know we're going to probably have a few people show up who didn't get tickets, right? Like, you're going to have to pick a different one. Uh, and, and so here's the thing. If we have 400 people show up at our Saturday night one, um, and we have 25 show up at the 9 a.m. on Sunday, that doesn't work. 
Amen? We want to be strategic about this. So I, 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 I wrote down a couple of frequently asked questions. Uh, that haven't, no one's asked me these yet, but I figure people will ask these things. So I just want to, as, as I kind of wrap up, I want to give you these because I think they'll preemptively answer some questions. So the first one is this. How are we going to manage man staff so many gatherings, right? One on Saturday, a couple on Sunday, two on Monday. How are we going to do that, Rob? Um, and and so, so let me say a few things here. Thing number one is, is that we learned last year because we did something different, right? We, we added the Saturday in. We learned that instead of just doing a whole bunch of gatherings on one day, that adding different days seems to create more opportunities for more people, which is why we decided to do this. We want to give as much opportunity as we can for people to come and hear about Jesus, right? And, and then here, here's the other piece. Historically, what we've done at New Hope is we've done just our regular gatherings on Sunday. So every Sunday, we do two gatherings, two gatherings, two gatherings. And then on Christmas Eve, whichever day that falls on, we've done a 3, 5, 7, and 11. So for us to use Sunday as part of this and to do one on Saturday, two on Sunday, two on Monday, we are actually doing one less gathering. We're doing less and we're being more effective. That's a good thing, right? And if you count the fact that we've been, we spent three years in Millersburg doing church over there, we're actually doing two less gatherings than we typically would, right? We're actually doing less, but we're being smarter. And, and I love this. We actually have one of our, our key musicians who isn't able to be here for one of the gatherings. And I love this. The pastor at the Lutheran church, Pastor Scott, is actually going to play with our band for the Saturday night gathering. I love it when the church is the church. Right, and we work together to tell people about Jesus. Here's the, the second frequently asked question I just want to answer. For those of you who December is just a tough month, you, you may legitimately go, Rob, I love this idea of working together and being strategic and being intentional about figuring out when I'm coming and who I'm going to invite and praying about that. Um, but this is a really hard month for me. And when I come to church on Christmas I really need that for me just in order to survive. And if that's you, l let me make a suggestion. I think you should pick a gathering and come just for you. Y you may even have your spouse stay home with the kids because you don't even want to manage them, right? Like, you can pick one and come for you and then pick another one on a whole different day and be on mission and invite someone else. Because this isn't just about us helping others make a Christmas connection. This is about us having the opportunity to make a life-changing connection as well. And I want that for you. So as we think about this gift, this Christmas connection, this week was just about making the list, just given the plan, right? No emotional responses that fizzle out. You've heard the plan. Now take it with you this week. Talk about it maybe over lunch, maybe over dinner, maybe over dinner every day this week. I don't care what you do. Take it with you. Talk about it. Pray about it. Whatever God says, do that. And then whatever he asks and whatever you decide in your heart to do in response to the greatest gift ever given, do it fully and with great joy knowing that we get to serve our king in this way. Because here's the thing. Christmas is coming. Whether you like it or not, heaven is coming. When Jesus came, heaven came. The only question is, are you going to help or hinder heaven's coming? And, and that's not like a, a guilt-filled question. There have been plenty of times in my life where I have hindered heaven's coming. I've not been helpful. I've kind of gotten in the way. But church, we have an opportunity this month to, by doing three simple things together, make a Christmas connection that changes our life and impacts our community and beyond. Think about that. Think about how God wants you to be involved.
a stranger. And you invited me in. I was sick. And you looked after me. I needed a teacher. And you inspired me. I was lost. And you prayed for me. I was addicted. And you helped me break free. I needed a mentor. And you were there for me. I felt alone. And you showed me true community. You helped me experience the joy of worship. You made me feel welcome and safe. You gave me the strength to keep going. You led me to Jesus. 